Marcelo. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the British are coming! The British are coming! (laughs) They're long gone. But did you know that Paul Revere, the guy who uttered those famous words, wasn't even famous in his own time? Around 80 years later, it took some excellent storytelling by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to create the myth. Today, we'll dive into the history of the poem that shaped a career and a country with historian Jeff Lantos. Plus, how tall are you? Would you believe that it isn't your width, but your height that has any relation to your sex appeal? And how much would you have to earn to compensate for not being the right height? We'll explain during our headline segment. We'll also toss out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky stacker and my trivia will not disappoint. And now, two guys who won't ever be half the storyteller that I am. It's Joe and oh, J-J-J-J-G. I don't know about that. OG can weave a mean yarn. (laughs) Given the right circumstances. Absolutely. Hey, everybody. Welcome to No, We're Not LeVar Burton podcast. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, it is the man, the myth, the legend, showing up on a Wednesday, Mr. OG. Not the fake OG on Twitter. You got your hair cut, by the way. I got all of them cut, actually. I got to get mine cut before we... You're good. Thanks. Before we head out for Nashville, I know people are listening to this. I'm already in Nashville. You can see the haircut, can't you? You Very much. I didn't didn't know if you'd notice it. It's incredibly handsome. Uh, But I met a bunch of you last night. I'm sure we had a great time. It was amazing. It was an incredible night, but we got an incredible show today. We're going to talk about a poem from the revolution. Of course, you've heard about Paul Revere's Ride. Jeff Lantos. There once was a man from Nantucket. That's a whole different thing. Oh. Yes. I heard it like in third grade. <laughs> you may have. That's a whole different show. We've got that. we got a couple headlines, quick hitting headlines. We normally do one. We're going to tackle two today. Overtime. Yes, but first. This is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like the course keeps changing right before your eyes. Whoa! And in order to maneuver it, you need an expert by your side. That's what Dell Technologies advisors do. They have the tech solutions you need to help you get out in front and stay ahead of the game. Woo! Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL. And do more with modern devices in Windows 10 Pro. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance. They should say GEICO makes it easy to stack, right? Your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. And it's a good thing too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All right, Jeff Lantos waiting in the wings, but let's get you some headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline, and this one is so controversial. This comes to us from the University of Chicago, and this is an abstract that our friend Marcus Garrett found from the university. Here is what you need to know. University of Chicago found that if you are taller, you are more attractive. And they looked at men and how attractive they are to people of the opposite sex. Looking at this chart, just to figure this out, and we'll, we've linked to this in our guide. It's also in the show notes. OG, if you are five foot two, to be as attractive as a person who is 5'11", you need to make 269 
thousand dollars. There's an income offset. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is, nice. if this weren't from the university of Chicago, I would have completely, and don't get me wrong, guys, I'm still rolling my eyes, but you need to make $269,000 more money. More or 269,000? It's 269,000 more. Oh, more than what? To be equally as attractive as somebody who's 5'11". Ah, so if you're 5'11 and you make 70 grand a year. Yes. You can be 5'2". And you got to be pulling down like 340. 5'10, you got to make $24,000 more. Okay. 5'8, 138,000 more. Um, kind of between those. When it comes to women, women, the optimal height, according to this, I believe is 5'7, if I'm reading this data set right. And uh, you're more attractive as you're shorter. Women who are 5'2, can earn $43,000 less. And by the way, there is, there is no upside for the opposite sex. M- men apparently like tall women at 6'6", six, 6'2", six, six, six feet, exactly the same as... Uh, so once you're 5'7", you should stop growing if you're female. N- n- be as tall as you want. Dudes don't care, apparently. It doesn't matter. After 5'7", it doesn't matter. That's right. And it's, it's only they're only looking at the opposite sex in this study, you know, I do want to bring this to a different level, which is that I like Sun Tzu, the art of war, the best battles, the one that's never fought. And certainly there are fights that we can do nothing about, right? You can't do anything about how tall you are, but I think you can understand that people have these implicit biases that maybe they don't even see, right? They don't even understand them. And we can roll our eyes at this study I will, and I am, but by the same token, OG, you're going to walk in for a new job and your boss is going to look at the way that you're dressed, how tall you are, the way that you look. I don't make up these rules, but there are you put together to get a fresh haircut. Yeah. But there are, but there are some fights that I think taking a good look at who you are and not just by the way, a physical appearance, but looking at what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, and how do I make my strengths better? How do I, how do I minimize my weaknesses? I was listening to podcasts this morning, as an example, where a gentleman was saying, a lot of people talk about their weakness. He said, if you know how to tell the story right, your weakness can become your biggest strength. It's interesting that you are talking about this because I, uh, over the weekend, last weekend, uh, read an article about how the issues associated with going back to work set aside COVID for a second. The issues about going back to work and people having to fall back, quote unquote, fall back in line as it relates to all of the expectations that are associated with working in an office. And the article was specifically written to men from women, kind of the generic, like, I don't have to have high heels on every day. Leave me alone, you know, type of thing. And it's interesting because there's this whole section of stuff that goes on about having to go back to the office, you know, and the expectations, both sides, women probably more unfairly than men for certain sure. in terms of expectations. And like, I'm supposed to look a certain way and have my hair done a certain way. And I mean, my God, they let you into an office with your hair that way. So what were they thinking? You know, exactly. But it's interesting, but you talk about biases and things like that, because it's true. You the benefit of Zoom is you only have to have the polo shirt on. You know, you just have the button. You can all the funny commercials that they made over the last year and a half about the the guy walking out like, "Hey, are we starting the party?" And everybody and he's in his underwear because he thought it was a Zoom thing. You know, why can't we be that way when we're in person? You know, I don't know. Give everybody some slack. That's what I'm going to say. I totally agree. And I think that the world is going to change fairly quickly as we get back to the office. And I, I think that's actually part of the reason why there's this great resignation going on. People are like, you do know, you think it, do you think it's going to be, do you think that there's going to be this, like, it's cool that everybody wears like shorts and flip flops? No. If you're on Wall Street? No, it's going to go hardcore the other way. I, I don't know that it's hardcore the other way, but there will definitely be a, the way you're put together matters. And taking Mm -hmm. care of yourself matters. And I think there is a a bias in some areas of the working world, especially if you're serving other people, 
where if you look like you take care of yourself, the customer is going to think you'll take care of them. Yeah, I can see that. You can, can do something about that. You can't do anything about your height. And those are still going to, I mean, they're still going to be that there, right? I mean, we've talked about, had some huge conversations around the world about race and about all kinds of issues in the past 18 months to two years. People are going to have feelings and they're going to have feelings that are beyond their conscious scope. They're going to have these unconscious reactions. And so control the things that you can control. As much as you can. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that line. And I know that some people don't like the battlefield analogy, but still Sun Tzu, the best battle is the one that's never fought. If you think ahead of time about all the things that you can control and about your story and about what your weaknesses are and how to project those weaknesses in a way that makes your story still resonate with people. How many people have we had on this show that have been terrible with money and are able to tell that story well, you know? This guy, oh, you were talking about other people. <laughs> yeah, other other people besides you and I. I will link to the study. You're going to get a giant eye roll too, like I did. And I wouldn't even be mentioning it if it wasn't 62 pages long and uh, is just a, uh, just, Wow. Uh, our second headline today comes to us from the world of crypto, and because of our schedule, we're recording a little bit earlier, so this story, I apologize, may be a little further on uh, than we're reporting here. This comes to us normally on shows like this. I try not to do breaking news, but I do want to get, oh, gee, your take on this one. Do you see news uh, early last week, Tether executives facing a criminal probe over well, whether they committed bank fraud, report says. Tether, by the way, the third most traded crypto out there. It is a stable coin. In an unregulated crypto, there's an opportunity for people to run afoul. Weird. Yeah, executives from Tether said to be facing a criminal probe over whether they committed bank fraud. This comes from Bloomberg. Uh, federal prosecutors are looking to whether Tether concealed from banks that their transactions they were doing with them were linked to crypto. What's interesting about this is there are some reports here, and this is way early on, that this may, this may begin, OG, a process of the U.S. government starting to put their hands around crypto a little more. I'll be conspiratorial. If they have a whole bunch of fraud cases, then, then the government can say, see, we need to regulate this. Yeah. Don't fall for it, people. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think. I don't think to some degree a little regulation would be would be bad. I do think it's just a reminder of what a wild west this area is, though. To your point earlier, and uh, but but my feeling has changed since we had Kevin Rose on the show talking about. Listen, if you're in there because you think this is stable, you're crazy. But if you're somebody that's going to take a little money that you know you can afford to lose, you put it into a few of these different coins and you dollar cost average in, like you do the prudent stuff in an area where you can, it's very difficult to be prudent at all. Control the things you can control. Is that a theme? You could, it, it must be the theme of today's show. I think you should expect more headlines like this in the future, don't you? Or like I saw on Twitter the other day and just hear me out. Here's what it said. Can I use an anonymous wallet to get paid in crypto, then buy an NFT for myself at a thousand times the cost basis so I pay up capital gains instead of income taxes? Asking for a friend. <laughs> it might work. Is that tax evasion for the win? Tax strategy? Is it, is it a strategy? And I, I, I don't know. what the Would the IRS consider that a strategy or would they consider that evasion? Like, I think if you're... It, <laughs> One million percent evasion. I was going to say, if your sole purpose is to defraud the government uh, into, it's almost like money laundering. Is that tax laundering that they're talking the, about doing? Uh, the thread uh, went on to talk about NFTs and how if you donate, they said, they said, no, no, here's what you do. Create a meaningless NFT, donate it to your charity of choice and say, hey, this thing's worth $100 million. And then somebody said, no, you've got to get a certified appraisal. He goes, and so then the, you know, the thread goes on, right? Like, so the invisible painting got a certified appraisal, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, right. cool. So the, so the appraisal has got to be done if it's over 5,000. Just sell a bunch of them at 4,900. Donate a whole bunch. Just make a whole bunch of crap for 4,900 bucks and say, yeah, it's worth 4,900. I think that's the substance over form argument that the IRS will come after you on. Speaking of the invisible painting that we reported on a few weeks ago, did you see that that artist got sued? You think? No, he got sued by another guy who said he thought of it first. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yep. you come up with it first. I love it. Yeah, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell nothing. I did nothing first. Wait, I've been doing nothing for a long time. That is exactly stealing my work product by doing zero. All right. I think there's a bunch of lessons here in our headlines. Number one is uh, don't commit tax evasion, tax fraud. Don't do it. Number two, I think, is crypto continues to be the Wild West. Not a reason to not get into it, but this will not be the last headline like this. And I think our third takeaway is get taller. Eat them Wheaties. Hey there, stackers. I love it when we tie money to history. Remember this poem from elementary school? Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. Blah, 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 and more words. I know that Longfellow made a ton of money off that poem, and there was lots of money at stake during the Revolution among a few more important things. So I get the tie-in for today's guest, Jeff Lantos. But do you know what else has made people a ton of money and brought lots of joy to the world? Cookies. Everyone loves cookies. So on behalf of National Cookie Day, today's trivia question is, what is the most popular type of cookie in the United States? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can sing. C is for cookie. That's good enough for me. Well, when you become a member of Navy Federal Credit Union, life gets better. You know, the process of buying a car can be so confusing. And the auto dealer, if you work with a dealer, and usually it's better if you are not a ninja to actually buy a car from someone else, from a private buyer, for me, because of my sales experience, we usually do the opposite, but I'm, I'm pretty good at negotiating there. And I have to tell you, though, that Navy Federal, their True Car app really, really, really helped me save a bunch of money on the car. But when you're buying a car, always focus on the purchase price, not on the payments. And to help you with everything behind the scene, like figuring out if you have to have a payment What's that going to be? So you're not talking about that to a car dealer. You can do that all on the Navy Federal app. And because things are so confusing, that's why Navy Federal created their fully loaded car buying experience. You can finance, buy, protect, and enjoy your auto purchase all through one convenient place. They have low rates and pre-approval that's good for 90 days. So when you're looking for the car, you know exactly what's in your budget and what you can afford the whole time you shop. You can save thousands off MSRP with their car buying service that, as I mentioned, is powered by TrueCar. You'll get exclusive member savings with Carfax, love me a Carfax, Geico, and SiriusXM. You'll learn more at NavyFederal.org forward slash car buying. It's NavyFederal.org forward slash car buying. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Your actual savings off MSRP may vary. Navy Federal Credit Union is federally insured by NCUA. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, Ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. I had a little horse named Paul Revere. Just me and my horsey and a quart of beer. Riding across the land, kicking up sand, shares posses on my tail because I'm in demand. Please tell me that Joe's going to rap this sweet song by the Beastie Boys. Wait, is Joe's not interviewing him? It's Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast? What is going on? You know what? Here comes Joe and Doc G now, so let's just leave this while we're ahead. I'm going to get you back to your trivia answer. The question was, in honor of National Cookie Day, what is the most popular type of cookie in the U.S.? According to OnePoll.com, apparently the go-to resource for these types of hard-hitting facts, the average American eats 18,928 cookies in their lifetime. That is a lot of cookies. And according to Huffington Post, America's favorite cookies are, at number five, 
oatmeal raisin cookies. Oh, gross. Uh, number four, Oreos with milk, of course. It, it, without milk, it's like number 82. Uh, number three, peanut butter cookies. Okay, now I'm listening. Number two, brownies. Not a cookie, but nice try. And the number one, as if we're even surprised, chocolate chip cookies. Time for me to go grab myself some cookies while I listen to Jeff Lantos. But for now, here's Joe. See ya. Well, look at who snuck in while Doug's doing the trivia. Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast is here. What are you doing here? Well, you know, every once in a while, I like to sneak in and make sure that uh, I get my voice in. I do an interview here and there, you know, just behind the scenes. I don't want everyone to think that Joe and OG and Doug really are taking care of it all themselves. There's there's us little guys in the background, little guys and gals doing things. I just right. wanted to make sure that I got some FaceTime and let everybody know that. I, that, that sounds like you're throwing a little shade and you've been down here for like 30 seconds and already kind of ripping on us a little bit. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I've had good teachers. I've been listening to the podcast for a long time. So, you know, Doug and I, we discuss things here and there and he gives me pointers. You are going to help us with history week. You talk to a brilliant author and I can't wait. Tell everybody who you talk to. I talked to Jeff Lantos about his book, Why Longfellow Lied, and it was spectacular because we go back and talk about the poem, Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Sure, the one that all these elementary school kids know, one if by land, two if by sea. Such a part of what I would call Americana. And what's fabulous about this book is we were totally wrong. Our interpretation of what this story means and even a lot of Longfellow's details are off. And it's just fascinating. People are going to wonder what the heck this has to do with money. So many things. Longfellow, number one, really largely, this was the highlight of his career. I mean, he was the guy that wrote the poem. So a whole career based on this thing made tons of Benjamins. I don't know if they were Benjamins at that time, but made tons of money based on that. And also, I and we've had other historians on, the Revolutionary War itself fueled by lots of founding fathers' money involved there. But there's this idea, there's there's some other ideas lurking, and I can't wait to talk to you after we hear the interview, because I think there's some more ways we can tune this in. Definitely. Yeah, let's do this. Let's listen to Doc G and Jeff Lantos. Coming down to the basement is my new friend, Jeff Lantos. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Let's talk Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He is a famous American poet and educator, and you make quite a claim. You say he lied. How did he lie? He distorted the facts about a significant event in American history, and he had a hidden agenda, and that's the reason he lied. I definitely want to get to that hidden agenda, but give us the cliff notes here. We're talking about the poem Paul Revere's Ride, Tell us what the poem is about and how it was accepted at the time. Paul Revere was the Hermes, the messenger of the American patriots. His first ride came after the Boston Tea Party, uh, where he was sent down to New York to tell the tea merchants there what had just happened in Boston and urged them not to accept any of the British ships that were bringing tea into New York. And then further, messaging went down to Philadelphia. So the whole East Coast was involved in this tea boycott in December of 1773. Revere was a silversmith in Boston, a member of what they called the the mechanics in those days, artisans who made their living with their hands. A very reliable guy, member of several social clubs, knew many of the leaders of the revolutionary movement. They trusted him. He was a good horseman which was very important in those days when you were riding 300 miles through all kinds of weather, day and night. So he became the messenger. And his boss was the Patriot spy master, a wonderful, brilliant guy named Dr. Joseph Warren, a medical doctor. Think about how ingenious it is to have your medical doctor as a spy master because anybody can walk into your office without suspicion, because the uh, assumption is they're going there to have their ailments treated. So 
not only could sick people walk in there, but also people with information that they needed to convey to Dr. Warren. On the night of uh, April 18th, uh, Warren began getting a number of messages saying that um, there was going to be a secret British march out of town that night, and they were, they were headed for Concord, Massachusetts, about 18 miles west of Boston. And the reason the British were headed for Concord is because that was the colonial supply depot. That's where all their war materials were stashed. Uh, not just gunpowder and muskets and musket balls, but also everything else that is needed for war, shovels, canteens, all kinds of food, thousands of pounds of codfish, salted codfish. You had to feed the army, give them protein. Thomas Gage, the British general, figured, well, if I can burn and destroy this colonial depot, uh, the colonists won't be able to fight back. They'll have words, but they won't have any bullets. And so that was the, the aim of the British that night. Seven or 800 soldiers were going to march 18 miles to Concord, destroy the colonial uh, military stores, they called it. And when Dr. Warren got word of that, he sent Revere and another alarm rider, William Dawes, riding through on different routes to Concord to warn them to get those supplies out of there as fast as possible, or, or at least hide them. So that was what Revere was doing on the night of April 18th. Now, it's notable, you mentioned already a few names that are not even really part of the poem. Warren and Dawes weren't even addressed. Already, we can tell that the poem was somewhat of a simplification. The poem was a lone hero myth, uh, a familiar trope in American history. Think of Gary Cooper and at high noon. Think of John Wayne at the Alamo. Think of Thomas Carlyle, the great man theory. This was Longfellow pairing the story back to the bone and telling it through the eyes of one man who did everything by himself. One reason he might have picked Revere is because it was a better word to rhyme than Dawes. That, that's an interesting take on history and what we choose to put in the stories we tell about history. You've already mentioned a bunch of facts that we see nowhere in the poem. So let's talk about how Henry Wadsworth Longfellow lied. One is he didn't mention the spymaster. He didn't mention Dawes. Tell me about some of the bigger and smaller lies, maybe even some of the more egregious ones that Wadsworth Longfellow told about Revere's actions. It might not be what he told is what he left out. It's very important to know that Revere and Dawes were two of approximately 30 alarm riders who were on the roads of Massachusetts that night. The colonial alarm system had been well honed for 100 years, all going back all the way to King Philip's War in 1676, 1675, 76. That's when half of the towns in Massachusetts were attacked and burned by Native Americans making what what turned out to be their last stand to stop incursions onto their land by the uh, white settlers. So at beginning in the late 17th century, the colonists of Massachusetts put together an intricate alarm system, not only involving riders, but also gunshots, bonfires, even trumpets. Uh, there were black people riding, there were women riding. And by the night of the British incursion into toward Concord, the system was so well organized that word of the British march spread all the way to the New Hampshire line before the British had even slogged through the marshes of Cambridge. Think about that. Word of their march had spread 40 miles, and they were still in Cambridge. And that's one reason why they were stunned at the number of colonists who lined the roads, not only on their way to Concord, but on their more importantly, on the way back, because there was only one road to Concord. And if you were a British soldier marching 18 miles into a hostile countryside, you weren't about to leave the road to get back. You had to get back on what was called the Great Road. Another thing that sticks in my mind is this idea of one if by land and two if by sea. We hear this all the time as if this was really significant. But now you say that in reality, that whole signaling system, at least to Paul Revere, was not that important. <laughs> no, that was a brilliant couplet by Longfellow. There was nothing iffy about it. Uh, there are a lot of ifs in that verse, and none of them apply because 
Revere already knew the British were going by sea because Dr. Warren had seen them climbing into their boats before he even called Revere. So Warren wandered down to the, uh, to the common where he could see the British boarding their boats. This was about nine o'clock at night. He goes back to his house, sends his apprentice to go get Revere. Revere doesn't show up at Warren's till 10, 10 p.m. By that time, Warren knows the British are going by sea. He tells Revere they're going by sea. And he also tells him that he'd already sent Dawes over the Boston Land Bridge two hours earlier. So Revere already knows another rider is heading toward Lexington and Concord. So uh, it's probably suggested at that meeting that Revere should leave Boston by boat through the north end because Dawes had already left Boston by land over the south end. There was only one little bridge connecting Boston to the uh, mainland. It was a a peninsula or an isthmus, as they called it. And there was a British guardhouse at the gate. At nine o'clock, they shut the gate. Nobody could get out of Boston by land. Dawes was one of the last ones out. According to some history books, he sort of faked being a drunken country bumpkin. So the uh, guards at the gate would think, oh, oh, this guy's no threat. We'll let him go. And you're saying as you couldn't get out, those lanterns were actually part of more of the early warning system to cities down the road, like Lexington saying, hey, something's going on here, as opposed for it to be a message for Revere himself. The lanterns were meant to be sent to one city, Charleston, which is across the Charles River from Boston. So by the time Revere got to the Charleston side in his little rowboat, the Charleston patriots who met him at the beach at the riverside said, we saw the lanterns because Revere gave the lantern assignment to two of his cronies. And they were the ones who went up to the top of the North Church and flashed those two lanterns, which meant the British were going by sea. But Revere already knew that. Another quote unquote lie that I find really interesting is that Paul Revere never really made it to Concord, which is something that (laughs) most people who read this poem would have no idea about. Yeah, that's probably Longfellow's most egregious lie. What happened was the British had uh, patrols out that night. They knew about the efficiency of the colonial alarm system. You know, that's really the great subplot of this whole episode is the brilliant community organizing that the patriots were able to put together here. This is really a story of when a community is able to organize, amazing things can happen. This is not a lone hero story. Uh, And that's often missed when kids read the poem and the teacher doesn't realize that this is really a story about the effectiveness of grassroots community organizing. Because every time a rider got to a town, he would bump another rider like a pool ball off to the next town. And imagine the whole of Massachusetts, north, south, and east of Boston, looking like the arteries of your heart branching out. One town would hear it, and then suddenly another rider would head to the next town. So that's the hidden story. But Revere was arrested by a British patrol. The British patrols were sitting on all the choke points, all the intersections, waiting for these riders, because they had their own intelligence network. Revere, at that point, had linked up with Dawes in Lexington. And he also linked up with a country doctor named Samuel Prescott, who just happened to be out visiting his girlfriend that night. Prescott lived in uh, Concord, and his girlfriend lived in Lexington. So he was visiting her that night into the wee hours. Finally, around midnight, 1230, he, he leaves his girlfriend's house, starts riding home to Concord. He's a country doctor. And he bumps in, coincidentally, bumps into... Uh, to Revere and Dawes, who were headed toward Concord as well. So they, they kind of suss him out and figure, uh, you know, they want to know what his politics are to make sure he's one of them. They find out, yes, he's a patriot, and they tell him what their mission is. And he says, fantastic, because I know everybody on this road as I treat them. So he's the one who goes up to all the doors because everybody recognizes him. Imagine someone knocks on your door at 1.30 in the morning. It's nice to see your doctor on the porch. So he helps them warn people between Lexington and Concord, which is about six miles, but they're about halfway. And sure enough, they want, they run into one of these British patrols who are sitting at a choke point along the road. Revere, this was cut from his three memoirs. Revere says, let's go at them. There are only two of them. There are three of us. We'll ride right at them. We'll knock them out of the way and we'll continue. So they charge them. They're ready for a fight. Revere, Dawes, and Prescott. But there are six other British soldiers hiding in the woods. And as soon as the uh, colonists come toward them, the others merge onto the road and 
calling us are outnumbered and they're arrested about three miles, three miles away from Concord. At that point, Revere is taken prisoner. His ride is over. But Prescott is on a fresh horse and he gives a giddy up and breaks through. And he also knows the uh, back roads. So he doesn't have to take the main road into, into Concord. He knows the territory. So he's the one who actually warns Concord. So it sounds like Revere was not nearly as big a figure as Longfellow made him out to be. Was anyone talking about Revere after 1775? Was he in the press or were people having this discussion about a big role Revere played in the 1800s? There's no mention of the midnight ride in his obituary. The Patriots, after the uh, war, were not eager to get this story out because Revere was doing something illegal as were all the alarm riders. They were defying the curfew, and uh, they were defying the uh, ruling authorities. The Patriots said, the less said, the better, because let's make it seem that we're the victims in this, that we took no offensive action, that we had, you know, that we were passive. Let's let that story continue to percolate. It was the PR campaign, and all the people who testified about what happened that night were prepped to say the same thing. It was naked British aggression. So how and when does Longfellow actually hear about Revere? Not till 1832. A publisher, Buckingham, uh, went into the uh, Massachusetts archives and came out with three accounts of Revere's ride, which had been buried. In fact, Revere had submitted one of his accounts to the uh, Patriot leaders, along with the other people who were involved that night, and they rejected his because it was too aggressive. Uh, It it wasn't the story they wanted the public to... uh, digest. So the story was buried, and it was uncovered by a Boston publisher, Buckingham, who published it in a a magazine in 1832. And lo and behold, who has a a piece in that same magazine? A uh, young uh, Bowdoin professor named Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And uh, Longfellow reads Revere's account, makes a mental note, and uh, puts it in long-term storage so that he can uh, pull it out at the right time. Longfellow was teaching at Bowdoin at the time, uh, before he was appointed at Harvard. He taught English until uh, 1854, when his poems began selling and he had enough money to retire. So help me understand this. The ride takes place in 1775. Longfellow hears about it in the 1830s and makes a mental note. Why why does he wait till 1860 to actually write Paul Revere's ride? Uh, he had a lot of other <laughs> he had a lot of a lot of other obligations at the time, and a lot of kids. He had five kids. He was teaching full time at Harvard by this time. He learned get this thirteen languages. Wow! He was a genius when it came to learning new languages. So he would go to Europe and pick up a new language in a month. A so, you know lingual genius. And um, he had a full class load, you know, in his diaries, his journals, you can read how tired he is of teaching and how he can't wait for the summer, you know, just like (laughs) teachers today. So tell me about 1860, though. Was there something more significant about what was going on in the world at the time that made him decide to write the poem then? Well, this was just prior to the secession of uh, South Carolina and four other five other, eventually more than that, southern states, and the the attack on Fort Sumter a year later. And also Longfellow's best friend, Charles Sumner, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, had been beaten up, I mean, really beaten up on the floor of the United States Senate by a uh, pro-slavery Southerner, beat him with a cane. And uh, Sumner was so injured uh, that he had to take years to recover. And uh, that was a terrible blow, not only obviously for Sumner, but for, for Longfellow too, because they used to see each other once a week. They loved their discussions. And Sumner was a fiery abolitionist. And he was pleading with Longfellow to say something about this. You, I need your help. I need your poetic help. And Longfellow said, be assured that as soon as the inspiration hits, I'm going to write something. Well, the inspiration hit in April of 1860. That was after Longfellow took a tour of the uh, the Old North Church. He went down to uh, the north end of Boston and went up into the uh, steeple where the lanterns were hung. And uh, the next day, he began the poem. So 
what you're saying is that Longfellow wrote the poem more about what was happening in modern day and less about what was happening in 1775. What was he hoping to do with the poem? He was hoping to inspire the northern states to get engaged and take on the South over the issue of slavery. He was a fierce abolitionist, Longfellow. He, he wrote poems against slavery way back in 1842. But his personality was such that he had trouble getting down into the mud like Sumner. Plus, he had this conflict with his father-in-law, who was pro-slavery, or at least needed the money that the slaves in the South were producing. So it was very awkward because he couldn't have Sumner and his father-in-law over for dinner at the same time. And his finally Longfellow's wife said, you got to stop this. They don't get along. We can't talk about slavery when dad's here. So Longfellow had that little bit of inhibition on the personal end, but also he was a poet. He, he liked to come at things, as Emily Dickinson says, to come at it slant. Tell the truth, but tell it slant, meaning come at it indirectly. Don't hit him on the head with it. So Longfellow brilliantly incorporated the revolutionary story to really tell what was a civil war story. So if we put that in perspective, if Longfellow was really telling a civil war story, let's look at this through the eyes of 2021. Was he successful? At the time he was. Uh, but over time, people didn't realize Longfellow's motives. I would say around up until around 1900, most teachers were aware that this was really a civil war poem. Longfellow dropped out of favor in the early uh, part of the 20th century. He was considered uh, not avant-garde enough. But Paul Revere's ride never lost its um, popularity, except the real meaning of the poem was lost. And that's why it's, it'll be good to let people know what was really behind this poem, what was going on in America at that time, what was his motive, and did it succeed? What did it do for his career and his wealth? What happened after Paul Revere's ride came out? His wealth never suffered a setback. He was the best-selling author, not only in America, but in Europe. His poems were, he sold more copies in London than he did in New York. He was very close with Charles Dickens. He was very close with European writers, took several trips to Europe. In fact, that's where he met his wife. He was revered. If you wanted to write a fan letter to a Longfellow, you didn't even have to put the address or the, the city. You just put Henry Longfellow, world famous poet. Hundreds of people would come to his door to say hello. He was a, a major celebrity and he was getting paid. Uh, he'd get paid $1,000 for 10 poems. This is at a time when a U.S. senator would make 6000 a year. Longfellow was getting $1,000 for 10 poems. So let's bring this discussion to modern day. What do you think we learn as a community from Longfellow's poem, his purpose in writing it, and how it was accepted over the years? I'm thinking about the stories we tell. Either, let's say we're in a job interview and we're telling stories about ourselves, or maybe you're a founder of a company and you're going to tell the story of how that company came to be. Longfellow told a story, but he lied, and yet his intentions were good. Is it okay to fib a little bit? I mean, as we're out there in the world telling our stories and moving forward in the world, is it okay to embellish? I mean, it certainly seemed to help Longfellow. Yeah, that's a great question, because I think it was William Randolph Hearst, or one of the newspaper publishers, said, uh, if, the, if the story's not as good as the myth, print the myth. You know, <laughs> as a country... We live by a lot of myths. If you study history, you realize that the stories are, are deeper than that. They can't just be boiled down to a, a guy chopping down a cherry tree or, or, or one guy riding through the night screaming, the British are coming. If you get into the backstory, I think you, you really get into the idea of, you, you get away from the great man theory of history. You know, that, that's so easy to teach and absorb. It's much tougher to teach people that, Community organizing at the grassroots level is really what, what changes a country. The politicians have to be pushed by the people at the bottom. The great man theory of history can only go so far. I mean, it's great for paintings and museums, but that's not how things really happen. The book is called Why Longfellow Lied, The Truth About Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Jeff, this is available everywhere? Yes, it is. Fascinating. Fascinating discussion. I was amazed by his book. And I, 
I remember reading through his book and saying, wow, this is really interesting. And then it just hit me how profound the story actually is, because I think it goes so much farther than the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. I think it really speaks to how we tell stories about ourselves and about our history and the importance of that. It's so important today. I couldn't help but think about messaging. And I remember when I was a kid, you really needed to be humble. You would work hard and somebody would notice you. You know, whenever I talk to people about your job at work, about getting a pay raise, about what you can't do that anymore. You really have to advocate for yourself strongly. And it's so funny that when Revere did this ride, right? Not only was it maybe not the huge deal that we thought it was, but also the messaging that Sam Adams and everybody had that we got to stay on message. Like, I think we all need to think that way about our careers. Yeah. And it really begs the question about embellishing. So Longfellow had the right intentions. He wrote this poem for all the right reasons, and yet he fudged some of the details, but did it for a good reason. And so I go back to like you or I going for a job interview, or let's say you or I are a startup and we're telling the story of our business, what role does embellishment play, especially if you have the right intentions, right? Well, if you are organizing your employees or if you're putting yourself in the best light, can we embellish? And what, yeah, where's that line? Where's that line between, uh, you know, I have a PhD in, in chemistry, which isn't true, and I really like dandelions, you know? I mean, there's a big difference between the two. You know, it's even more subtle. It's like I headed up a team that produced X versus I was on a team that produced X. You may still have all the same experiences. Your intentions may be right. In the case of Longfellow, the way he changed the truth actually furthered the cause of America. It furthered the cause of the United States. It brought people together during the Civil War. I mean, Longfellow sent his own son into the Civil War and he was badly injured. Interestingly enough, two of Paul Revere's grandchildren were also killed in the Civil War. So, you know, these things matter and have consequence. And I still don't know what the answer is. I don't still know where the line is when it's okay to embellish. There's another truth here that I was thinking about as I was listening to the two of you, which is when we give each other feedback and we talk to each other about things, this idea that Longfellow is ostensibly writing about the Revolutionary War, but it clearly is about the Civil War, right? That is so powerful, I've found, when you're giving feedback, especially when you're having uncomfortable conversations with people, being able to draw in this this other thing and not look directly at the problem, not be so damned, you know, a friend of mine used to say, Joe, you got to put some velvet on your hammer, right? <laughs> and the way to do that is maybe not to look directly into the sun, but to bring in this, this metaphor, this allegory, this other thing and tie it into what's happening today. It makes people get it more. Yeah. Longfellow was a master of subtlety. And it's funny because it made him so darn effective during the Civil War era, but it also led to the misconstruing of his poem in modern day America. And it reminds me, you and I were creators, but ultimately we're all creators, right? We all put things together, whether it's at work or with our families, et cetera. You only have control of your creation until the moment you put it out there and then you no longer own it. It's really owned by everyone else. And so Longfellow's poem only belonged to him up to the point where he published it. People during the Civil War era understood that it was about the Civil War, but we today own it in a very different way. And in a lot of ways, I think that's okay. I think it is too. Last thing I want to talk about is this idea that the two of you discussed around community, because I think when we talk about the financial community and the people around us and lifting each other up, right? I think there's a powerful message there too. There's this myth of the great man theory, right? This idea that one person stands up and changes the world. I think what Lantos and Longfellow were both getting at was that really it's about community organization. It's about coming together as a community and lifting everyone up. And Longfellow's story, as well as Revere's, really pushes that point. Well, it looks like OG's coming back down the steps. Thanks a ton, 
Doc, for hanging out, for talking to Jeff Lantos here on History Week. Great things happening, I'm sure, at the Earn and Invest podcast this week as well. On Monday, we talked to Amy Blacklock and Vicki Cook about their book involved in estate planning, a topic that often we stay away from because it scares us. And their book is wonderful and teaches us that we can break it down into more simple points and manage it. On Thursday, we're talking with Frank Vasquez about one of my favorite topics, annuities. Annuities confuse us to no end. Are there such things as good annuities? Frank and I break it down. Oh, my favorite topic too. Money Nerds Unite. Thanks a ton, Doc. Thanks for having me on. I'm Rocky Lalvani, the Profit Answer Man. And when I'm not helping small businesses stack Benjamins for themselves, I'm stacking Benjamins for myself. Hey, have a seat again, man. That was a that was a long time in the restroom. Why does everything have to be a poop joke for you? It, it's it's. I just wonder where the hell you went for all that time. You think I was in the bathroom that whole time? I have no idea where you were. I was at the bar, yo. What's up? <laughs> Doc, Doc G just schooled us on doing an interview. Hey, let's throw out David Lifeline, tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Caffeine in the afternoon, baby. Hello. 160 milligrams of this wonderful drink it's called a ZOA. A ZOA. It's your loved ones in your time. And with some caffeine, you could actually you can be enjoy f- your loved ones. <laughs> it's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash heart. I almost said heart rate because I was thinking about uh, uh, a little It does rate. explain a little bit of the palpitations. Maybe. But- stackybenjamins.com forward slash haven life for a free quote. It's a simple application. It's online. You'll get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and all their policies issued by Mass Mutual, more than a 160-year-old insurer. Hey, I want to take kind of a right turn today and uh, talk about this question that somebody left in the Facebook group, The Basement. Join us over there at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. That leads you right to the Facebook group. Sandy wrote a question, said, how does somebody go about getting interviewed on the podcast? There's someone local I'd like to recommend. And we've had this question a lot lately, OG, and I just wanted to use this opportunity to bring this up because number one, getting interviewed on the podcast is actually very difficult. We get about 70 pitches a week and at oh, the, is that all? Yeah, and at the most we can accept two. So that tells you what your odds are when you pitch us. It also tells you I need to know as much about that story as possible when you send us a pitch either to joe at stackingbenjamins.com or team at stackingbenjamins.com. I need to know as much as possible. And we get some really bad pitches. We also are not the marketing department for whatever you're selling. Just know that. That's not the purpose of our interviews. Uh, we generally get authors as longtime listeners to the show know because that's when they're available. And they also have something specifically, a topic we want to talk about. And we're going to mine that Uh, for as much as we can get an author to talk about. And then if you want more, then obviously you're going to go buy the book. And if not, hopefully we made it worth your time while our guest was here. Uh, A great way to be on the show is to be part of our potpourri episodes. And to do that, Gertrude every week posts mom's show and tell. And that's where people talk about great stuff that they're doing. Content creators, if you're somebody that has a great blog post or a podcast episode, if you do podcasts, whatever it is, mom show and tell every week in the basement. And we, we do mind those for those potpourri sessions. And every once in a while, we also find somebody to come on the show, but that's a great spot. Obviously the Haven lifeline, this segment right here, we try to answer every question that we get. So if you've got a question for the show, well then certainly go to the Haven lifeline. But I thought it'd be good to address that in one place for people because I feel that uh, listeners to the show, I think, wonder, how do people get on? We try to have people that have a good story. And generally, it's a story that we don't know the answer to. Like, who knew that Longfellow's poem was really about the Civil War when it ostensibly is about Paul Revere? Who knew that? I had no idea. So if you can tell me a story that I will not know the answer to, and I think that it will surprise our audience. I love those stories the best. Those are, those are my favorites. You were trying to get something done. Something got in your way 
and you found a way around it. I want to know all that. So that's our question for today. That was a tough question, OG. You handled it very well, actually. I like your answer there. Good, good stuff. It was the second part you said that really got me. Well, you handle a lot of the, I mean, to be fair, you know, I see them all also generally as they come in and, um, uh, I don't really deal with them. I know you and Karen do a lot more, but, but I do think it's funny when I read them and they're like, you know, help me sell this thing. <laughs> what? What's the story? Like, give me something cool to say. Yeah. We're on, we're on like episode number 1100. Let's hear something cool. So we like cool stuff. It's exactly it. Not the usual Haven Life uh, stuff we do, but a good time for us to kind of take a time out and tell you what we're looking for. But if you know, it helps everybody. If you've got some great, great, great uh, story that we need to hear, joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Send me those stories. All right. That's going to do it for today. Lots and lots of people to thank. First of all, thanks to everyone who's left us a review. We are sending books out every week, OG, of people that that have left us a review. And if you send me an email that you left us a review, please don't give us a five-star review just because I asked you to. But if you are going to leave us a five-star review and you're okay with telling me that you did, I want to also give you a book from an author who's been on the show. And I've been giving people choices. I've got that many books. So I said, I'll put your name in a hat trying to give away as many as we can. So send me that if you've done it, but thanks to everybody who has left us a review of the show. Here's one five stars from F hacks, J Dendy. Great show. The guests are always knowledgeable and entertaining. The conversation between Joe and OG is always great. I look forward to new episodes. See succinct to the point and fantastic. And mom is bragging about that one currently by hanging it on the fridge. Last but not least, if you're somebody that needs better financial help in your corner, OG and his team are taking clients and the way to have a conversation with them about how they can help you make better decisions, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. And that leads you to their calendar to set up that meeting. All right. That's going to do it for today. Lots of other people to thank. Doug's going to do the honors. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, do you want to be a high achiever? Remember the advice from Jeff Lantos. It's about telling your story well. No matter where you've been, creating a narrative can win the day for your career, like it did for Longfellow, or for your nation, like it did for the Founding Fathers. Second, not that tall? Realize there are some things you can't control, and some things you can. not Fight the battles you can win, and know the rest is out there, whether we like it or not. But the big lesson? One if by land, and two if by sea? Sounds like my ship's coming in. Time to go. See ya. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Do you want to know how Longfellow used storytelling to make Paul Revere into a national hero? Check out Jeff Lantos's new book, Why Longfellow Lied, The Truth About Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Thanks also to Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast for helping out with today's show. You'll find Earn and Invest, a podcast with second-level money discussions wherever you're listening to us right now. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2021, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by Taylor Stevens with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen, check out our show notes page written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. Brooke and Joe also collaborate on a guide to the show and with lots of extras we couldn't include on today's podcast. Heck, they'll also throw in some life money lessons from Joe and it's all free. It's called The Stacker, and you'll find it at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. Once we get all of this goodness bottled up, it goes over to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart, who helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to talk about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group, The Basement. She also is our social media coordinator, so say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. 
She and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. For a URL that'll take you right to our Facebook group, by the way, type stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, leaving you with this safety tip. Don't substitute your gym's spin class with your dryer's spin cycle. Believe it or not, they are not the same. So I've been spending a little more time on social media lately. That's healthy. <laughs> and and I've enjoyed some of the conversations I've been in. But did you see that the the Cleveland Indians are no longer the Cleveland Indians? Next year. They are going to be the Cleveland Guardians now. And initially, when you think of Guardians, what do you think of? Marvel movie. Me too. I think of Marvel, I think of Disney. So I, I thought, what a horrible, horrible name. And then people from Cleveland told me, especially Kevin from Family Money Adventures, but other people told me as well, that they didn't want a rock and roll name. In fact, I threw out, why wouldn't you do something about rock and roll? And uh, another stacker told me, said, hey, you know, that's kind of the fad name and they didn't want that. And then Kevin piped in and told me that the WNBA team that folded was the Rockers. And so they've already tried that, but the, there's a beautiful, beautiful art deco bridge downtown in Cleveland, which is the guardian bridge. And, and I ran a race in Cleveland once. In fact, this is a fantastic holiday fun race. It's what's, what's the movie with the rider BB gun? You'll shoot your eye out. Christmas story. Christmas story. <laughs> that house is in Cleveland. You start downtown you can do one of two things. You can run a 5K, which is out to the house, or you can run the 10K, which goes by the house and comes back. And it's pretty wild. The house is a museum now. It's really neat to run by it. Just if you've watched the, the movie A Christmas Story, which I think is just a classic, it's a good time. But it goes over that bridge, OG. Have you seen the Guardian Bridge? No. No? It, it is a really cool bridge. So I get it while they're there. I get it for people from Cleveland. But I also think there's just, I don't know, the Disney thing, just, I don't know. And then, Done by 40, who is on Twitter a lot, responds to me. He goes, you know, I think that they should have paid homage to the shipping industry on Lake Erie. Like, Cleveland was known for that, right? The old days of shipping. And they could have called them the Cleveland Steamers. And I retweeted that. Saying, did this you not is a good- know that, or you just thought it was a funny joke? No, I had no idea. Oh, okay, <laughs> I had no idea, so I retweeted it, <laughs> and and I even told Cheryl, I'm like, that's a great freaking name. Yeah, this is a this is a the Cleveland Steamers. Yes, is is a fantastic name for a baseball team, and so I'm uh I I organized online uh some golf with my brother in law who's from Cleveland. And I told him, I said, dude, I don't like this name Guardians. He's like, oh, it's great. It's for the bridge. I'm like, I know, but there's all the Disney stuff. I'm like, a guy online had a great idea. He said, <laughs> he said that we should call it the Cleveland. St- <laughs> he said that we should call it the Cleveland Steamers. Does that sound great? So my brother-in-law goes, oh God, no. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? It's perfect. Cheryl even said it's awesome because do you know what a Cleveland steamer is? Yes. <laughs> Urbandictionary.com. I, I am not going to tell you what a Cleveland steamer is, but to DB40 right now, my middle finger is straight up in the air. <laughs> and, and look, luckily I joke around enough on Twitter that I think people thought I knew what was going on. I had no idea. I had no idea. And I retweeted it. Yes. Cleveland steamers for the win. 
This is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like you're going 100 miles an hour, barely keeping up. But to cruise through challenges, you need someone who's right there with you. That's what Dell Technologies advisors do. They have the tech advice you need to get past whatever's in front of you and get to where you want to go. Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL and do more with modern devices and Windows 10 Pro.